Yeah, that was uh, re really interesting um, for what it could, for like the tasks that could be completed and the part about inferring the reasons that the parent had, I just like, I totally missed because I feel like, you know, if I see a parent move a stool, like I can totally imitate it without understanding why the stool needs to be moved. And I felt like that robot you know, putting the chip in could be in the exact same situation. They might have no idea that the chip's even broken. You know, if if they're just if they're just imitating. So like, how does like inferring reasons, you know, um, get approached? Yeah, thank you. Um, good question. So, yeah, I did mention a little that there's a lot of knowledge engineering and background knowledge, um, and there there's a certain form of cause effect reasoning in that, but but it's all kind of action and task oriented is like if I want to perform this sort of high level action, this is the low level action that does it. Doesn't it doesn't really inspect states and facts in the states so much to see what which facts are changing. Um, so that's something we definitely want to go for. But um, I think the main form of reasoning as opposed to background knowledge is that kind of parsing problem. Like was this if it, the robot put something down, is because it actually had to go there or because they just had to free up this gripper to do something else. Um, so in that way, it's doing some reasoning. But yeah. but a human does have to provide the big database of all the intentions and the secret yeah. subsequences they might cause. Which could be loaded in in Narcisse, right? Is it just something I'm, that's just a syntax that I pictured in my head. Um, it, yeah, certainly. But, but it could also be, it could also be like observed and generated through observation, if not the exact observations that are being imitated. Yeah, uh, so I, I definitely agree. Yeah, it, and we want to go in that direction that it's yeah, learning yeah, from experience yeah. more. Uh, but I think that's that has some challenges too. Um, if those higher level intentions that I hand coded are hidden, even if it's just observing a new sequence of actions, how does it really? form this structured internal model. Um, so that would be non-trivial. No, it's very interesting. It's very satisfying answer. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Okay, quick question, especially to the last two speakers, because it was nice to see one, like, the talk with the um, cognitive event calculus, and after this, Nico's talk. To both of you, how do your formalisms actually complexity-wise work? Like, starting out with event calculus back in the time of Bob Kowalski, this was pretty much prologue style. Like, this was really quick, this really compiled nicely. But when you throw in modalities, aren't you actually so far out of provably being quick? So how do you get your real-time reasoning then? Or why are you sure it works? Same to Nico. So you, you, you have the beautiful moment where you said, well, okay, it's NP-hard, NP-complete, one of the two. But it's not that bad, because all others are worse. Nonetheless, if you actually would not say, okay, I want to build a general AI which can move in a general environment, which can real-time react, you don't want to hit an NP-hard problem, right? Or at least you don't want to hit the bad, the bad area of this NP-hardness. So what's your take on this? Do you care? Well, I guess I'll go ahead and go for that first. Um, is, it, is it working? Okay. And I'll say that speed absolutely is a concern for me on the matter end, and to an extent, it, to an extent, this is sort of a Hail Mary in that we don't have matter using CEC codelets yet. We're still designing the CEC AC logic. So, our hope is that by dividing the proving in between codelets, because individual codelets can be focused on a specific inference rule, a specific task, that so long as when you set up proof through matter, you, you intelligently select, or I guess the ADI intelligently completely selects which codelets to use, that the speed will be, you'll get the speed that way. It'll be sort of a faster reasoning if you're only going through the matching of a few different rules. But you're absolutely right that speed is a concern. That's actually something I'm dealing with now because I'm trying to write a form of, at least a, a, a generic abstract interface for codelets that'll make it very easy for, say, a philosopher to write their own codelet or a logician to write their own codelet. And about the fastest ways to do that in a way that truly captures the meaning of the inference rules goes back to that really slow, really grinding semantic analysis. So 
to an extent, it's a hope that the codelets help offset that, but it is a problem we're aware of and not quite sure how to solve yet. Uh, okay, so does this work? Okay, um, okay, I mean, I agree that NP completeness or NP hardness is probably not <coughs> what we should shoot for, but um, um, I mean, uh, the, the NP hardness result really is uh, when you want to find an optimal concept. And if you just want to find a nearly optimal concept in some heuristic sense, then it's actually possible in polynomial time. So, um, I mean, if you think about human thinking, then I don't think that humans in general find the optimal solution right, but rather they perform some kind of heuristic reasoning in the sense that uh, they try to, well, I don't know what they do, but... Uh, Let's call I mean, it satisfying. Right, right. I mean, you just, uh, you have some intuition and you try to, uh, you just follow your intuition and in this way you you get some solution, but you, you have no idea if it's a good solution or the best solution. I mean, your intuition suggests that it's a good solution, but you never know, right? I mean, for instance, if you consider things like the traveling salesman problem, uh, where you want to find the shortest path or something like that, then uh, people or humans usually have a good intuition for uh, what, what is a good path, but they have no idea how, how good it really is. And of course, this, uh, this also depends on things like whether you consider Euclidean distances or completely different things and then uh, humans probably have no idea what, what a good route might be, right? If, if it's not longer uh, like in your intuition of, uh, of regular distance, then uh, you probably wouldn't even find some nearly optimal solution. Thank you. Uh, for thoughts. Oh. Uh, you had talked about forgetting in the context of emotion for, for that. Did you only mean it for that, or was that just for an example? Um, yeah, there are two, two basic uh, situations when um, uh, structures can be forgotten in this system. And one is uh, emotional situations. and. Uh, um, a situation can be emotional even though, uh, I mean, if, if it has an, an emotional importance, like, uh, let's say, uh, red is not perhaps um, emotional in itself, but when combined with red battery, for example, it can become emotional. So then the notion of red is uh, not going to be forgotten. And uh, the second um, um, situation when uh, it will forget is when uh, a concept uh, isn't used uh, uh, very often, so that's uh, yeah. Okay, I'm particularly interested in like where I parked my car three days ago, as opposed to yesterday or now. Is, so, is that is that integrated into this? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah. yeah, the concept of forgetting in the context of where I parked my car last week, or where I parked it three days ago, as opposed to where it's parked now. Yeah, right. So um, where, where you uh, the information that you parked your car in some place three weeks ago uh, will become older and uh, not not useful uh, uh, anymore, and then it will uh, eventually wither away, disappear. Okay. Paul. Okay. So I have a question each for for pain and cause. For for pain, the question is. Um, so the difference between reasoning and learning, typically in a cognitive model, it comes about because you've got working memory versus long-term memory, and reasoning changes working memory, learning changes long-term memory. Logics typically don't have that distinction, and so if you're just changing beliefs, you can't really distinguish uh, reasoning from learning. I was wondering if that's the, essentially what's going on in, in, in what you were talking about. But for for class, the question is, so you're building these deep networks, but are you doing deep learning in the sense that you are learning the hierarchy of parameters to be able to do the kinds of classification that these systems are able to do? Okay. Uh, I know this is probably a controversial uh, decision, design decision, but uh, from the very beginning, uh, in ours, there is only one memory. So uh, one thing we do not distinguish is a separate learning uh, working memory or short-term memory from long-term memory. Uh, but uh, 
we believe the belief is we keep we keep that that distinction uh, instead of use uh, two separate memory, but use instead use two kind of like a matter of degree uh, or uh, some kind of uh, quantitative difference. So what we have is in the memory, everything has uh, several value attached. One I already mentioned is uh, a priority. That is, uh, next moment, what's the chance for this thing to be used? Uh, another thing is what we call durability. Uh, that's actually a different item has different forgetting rate. So something you, you can activate and, and priority become pretty high. But at the same time, it will decay very fast. So that kind of thing is very similar to what we, we say, uh, working memory phenomena. Uh, so uh, I know there is a, a tons of psychological evidence supporting the distinction of this tool, uh, but I haven't been convinced that uh, we have to, to separate piece of memory in AGI instead of using one uniform mechanism, but at the same time capture both. So there is some benefit because for example, I don't have to decide when to move something from working memory into long-term memory. Because when the durability becomes high enough, uh, something gradually becomes remembered longer. So there is no uh, clear cut, you know, who is on which, which side. Uh, on the same line, there is also, you see, we don't have a separate, say, semantic memory from procedural memory or uh, that kind of thing. Uh, just because, but that distinction is still there. There's some knowledge which is procedure by nature, some knowledge of particularity by nature, but they can all be integrated into the same memory. That's basically. So would you say that there's a continuous kind of a uh, emergent um, uh, short-term, long-term distinction? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's, it's just a matter of degree. Yeah. So many uh, a procedure that. It's not a matter of degree anymore. It's, uh, it's different type, but they can still be stored together into the same structure. Yeah. So uh, the question was about uh, deep learning uh, and what we, uh, whether whether that was uh, that's what's going on in, in those transparent networks. And um, uh, it's uh, quite different because uh, um, deep learning. Uh, um, the ordinary kind of deep learning is, uh, presupposes uh, the ordinary kind of uh, networks with uh, weights and uh, back propagation and so on. And I don't have that in the, in, in the transparent nets. But um, they develop uh, organically all the time. And uh, in that way, will be naturally created uh, several layers. So in that sense, it will become uh, deep and uh, hierarchical. And another thing is that uh, uh, sometimes when they compress, uh, the networks will be rebuilt. So compressed, will, uh, we can look for uh, equivalent or lossy or non-lossy compressions of uh, these uh, networks. So it's basically about compressing uh, propositional formulas instead. And that opens the possibility of finding new ways of compressing and new ways of building uh, <coughs> Uh, general concepts and uh, um, feature uh, sets uh, that are perhaps not captured by the ordinary kind of uh, deep learning uh, algorithm. I don't know, but uh, that's, that's a possibility. Anyone else? Yeah, Questions? Yep. Here. Here. Um, it, with, with the stuff you're doing from folk and air, I mean, I, I guess I feel like I have to fill in a little background. I mean, folk and air's basic notion was, was of a mental space, and there, there are two mechanisms of <coughs> blending and compression that are, that are general ways of, of producing new mental spaces, and his claim is that basically all of human thinking is organized in that that's how you do um, uh, <coughs> essentially the, the way you solve problems is, is by manipulating these spaces and, and combining things and it, it's a predictive model uh, of learning. So, so the mental space has to have be populated both 
by behaviors and, and by objects. So, so when you're blending two things, the, the question is both how, how do the behaviors of the two things, so, so to say it's a centaur, you have to, 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 to properly blend it, you have to say what it does as well as, you know, it has the head of or the body, upper body of a person and the lower body of a horse. But so, so if you really wanted to, I mean, there, it's not a logic-based approach. It's essentially saying you're creating a, a very particular type of frame in which you can then manipulate objects. He calls it run a simulation. You know, so like if you want to find out whether um, to somebody coming down a mountain and somebody going up are going to meet in, in somewhere in the middle or not, you sort of can make a blend of the two of them going up, one is starting at, at one point, the other one at the other, and then see if they, they meet together. And, and his examples are pretty compelling. The question though is, you know, what, what sort of logic is there, or are you really replacing, uh, you know, the logic with those three operations, the, the blending, compression, and, and simulation. So are you working towards developing a systematic <coughs> approach to, to uh, generating mental spaces? No, uh, I mean that's the short answer. No, <laughs> I mean it's really about, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically about computing conceptual games. Okay, so we're running out of time. Uh, if there is one last question, we have time. Okay. Otherwise, we'll thank the speakers once again. Thank you for coming.